Good morning. One of the many hats I wear at the Navy Experimental Diving Unit, and I'll call that the NEDU from here on out, is that of an accident investigator. And I'd like to just start by saying that I'm one of you. Uh, I'm not a researcher lost uh, in the weeds, that I can't see the forest for the trees. I, I still remember which end of the regulator goes in my mouth. I pack my share of canisters. And I, I never have a vested interest in the investigations that we conduct. And let me just say, if during this presentation, if I inject any kind of humor or sound cavalier, uh, please understand I, I recognize the seriousness of this topic, and I hope you do as well. Over the years, uh, a lot of us in this room have lost personal friends and, and family in, in accident investigations through diving. So I recognize the importance of, of this and the, the seriousness of, of investigating thoroughly. So what we do, I'm going to go over briefly just uh, what we do, what we investigate, uh, who we do it for, why we do it, uh, what we do, what it costs, uh, what we don't do, what we've learned, and maybe possibly some results and recommendations. At one time, I thought the, uh, the diver in the top left picture, then the rebreather, I thought he was the, the best diver I ever knew. And after six years of accident investigations, that diver has become the most conservative diver I've ever known. So I've seen a lot of things that uh, I look at and say, well, that, that could have possibly uh, been avoided. And so I've learned a lot through these investigations and has definitely changed how I uh, do my own diving. We investigate open circuit, closed circuit, helmets, surface supplied, and also ancillary equipment. And by ancillary, I mean dry suits, um, buoyancy compensators, other equipment that the diver may be using that may have been contributing factors or triggers to a, an, an incident. And uh, obviously with closed circuit, there may be uh, open circuit bailout involved, so it's not just exclusively closed circuit. And so we may have other issues as well. Who we investigate for? At the top of our list are all U.S. military commands. And we typically get all of the incidents that may occur there, not always fatal, but we'll do perform accident investigation on those. We also will perform investigations for federal, state, and regional government agencies. And we do this on a case by case basis if it's a, of interest to the Navy, and we may work out there with them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I proceed. Who we don't investigate for? And I'll let that speak for itself. Uh, I don't know if you'll recognize uh, Boris and Natasha there from Bullwinkle. So we, uh, we don't uh, represent or do any kind of investigation for litigants, arbiters, actuaries, insurance companies. And that's just not our business. So the military investigations really are our business. And in the middle there, we have an incident occurs. And the first thing we're going to look at is, of course, the equipment, the maintenance of the equipment. But we understand there may be an underlying reason for this incident. Maybe uh, the way the troops are trained, or maybe an operational how the equipment was used. Imagine that you've, uh, you've gone out and used your rebreather for several hours. I don't think many of us would do this. Then bury it in the sand for two days, and then come back and use it for several hours again. So we've got some interesting operational requirements there and also things that we have to look there as well as just the equipment and the maintenance. And of interest here is the, uh, what I said, once upon a time not so long ago. I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, with our more austere environment we've gone to. We're going to have to uh, start possibly changing the way we look at what we investigate. So what we do. First thing, establish a chain of custody. If typically, if there's not a chain of custody, we won't do an investigation. If it's come from someone uh, and we don't know the background of the equipment, then we'll not do the investigation. Typically, especially with the military equipment, we'll collect the, any field reports, and all the military equipment is always going to have some kind of equipment history documents. So we know when the equipment was last maintained, when the rig was packed, who packed it, what it was packed with. So we have a lot of equipment there. Of course, that probably does not hold with most of the civilian type equipment we look at, but sometimes we get a little of that. And we're quick to separate fact, theory, and hypothesis from, from our investigations. And then I mentioned there about observational testing, gas analysis, our reporting and recommendations. 
Observational testing, by that I mean uh, how that may differ from R&D. And a lot of our uh, equipment manufacturers in here are in the R&D business. Well, we're not really in the R&D business when we're doing our accident investigation. We put on a different hat than we may do typically in our testing and evaluation of, of life support equipment for divers. In, in accident investigations, uh, we take the, re the re uh, equipment as received and without modification we perform tests on it. And so this would be different than, let's say, experimental where you may alter uh, a device, then you block on certain factors, and then you, you watch the results, and then it's kind of like a do loop. You go back and make changes and see what effect it may have. Oscar already talked about canister challenging and how to do that both uh, sampling through the canister or uh, the entire canister itself. We like to do gas analysis. Uh, we, sometimes we may get five or six tanks may come in on an a, uh, investigation, especially with closed circuit with a lot of bailout. We're not necessarily going to look at all of the contaminants in these gas sources. Certainly we'll look at the gross constituents to see if, if what's in the tank is consistent with what's labeled on the, on the tanks. And we may, uh, we may send gases out for, for analysis if we think there's, there's a source of interest there that might have contributed to the, to the incident. What I would like to share at this time when I'm looking at gas analysis is how I almost got fooled one time. I was investigating, and, and it doesn't really matter who or what, but uh, I was investigating a closed circuit rig and looking at a bailout bottle and doing just what you have here, the, the gross constituents. And the bottle had a regulator on it. And I turned it on and it had about 2,000 PSI in it. And I uh, sampled the gas and it was in keeping with exactly what was labeled on the tank. And I thought that was, okay, it looks good. And as I lifted the tank and uh, to put it away, I noticed it was kind of heavy. And I went and I shook the tank and I heard a lot of sloshing. And it turned out that this tank had all but about two inches at the very top, uh, just, uh, just below the dip tube, was full of water. And so I was just about full there. If I hadn't lifted this tank up and recognized that it was a little heavy, obviously if someone had tried to use this tank in any kind of a uh, prone position, that dip tube would have been full of water and not with that small amount of gas that was trapped at the top there. I conducted a test on this as to find at least one methodology of how this could have happened. There may have been others. So that was just, uh, just one way there that I was on the lookout for, for things we might recognize in, in our gas analysis. All right, after we've conducted our, our testing, it's uh, time for us to report and kind of break it down into the, the causes of the incident. Some of these overlap, obviously. At the very top of the list is going to be human error or possible medical conditions. Uh, the, obviously, the medical condition part, we don't uh, work too closely with the medical examiners, but uh, when we when need to, we, we will. We try and keep ourselves separate and look strictly at the equipment. The Navy is not in the business of making money, and nor are they in the business of losing money. So just to uh, give you an idea of the breakdowns of, of what it costs to conduct a, an analysis and you may look at some of these numbers and say, oh my gosh, that's, that is simply unbelievable. And yes, it is. It's uh, some very uh, large numbers there. Uh, if you were able to, uh, to recognize the amount of effort and the assets and the number of people and time that go into one of these investigations, you quickly see how these numbers can, can climb very quickly. What we don't do. I put some definitions in here so you'd understand what, uh, what I meant by some of these. And forensics, obviously, we, uh, we don't do anything that... Uh, is open for public debate. When we uh, produce a report, it, uh, as uh, Oscar said, his uh, is, is run by the police. Uh, ours are typically, we do the work for those who I mentioned there, the, the military commands, and they're the ones that are really the, the uh, purveyors of the documents and are the ones that are going to release the, uh, the, the report to those who are suitable to, to have it. We don't do any uh, reenactments or replications. We probably wouldn't find many folks that would want to help us with, uh, with any reenactments on on these, but I do have one example of a reenactment we did do, one of our occasional exceptions, is we had had a, a rebreather where a lot of gas had been lost very quickly in the diluent over a very short dive, and unfortunately we weren't sure if it occurred during the dive or during the recovery process. And so we actually looked at how the, the equipment was recovered after it was removed from the victim, and part of that was a rough boat ride in a rib, a, a rubber boat back to a, to a dock, so we wanted to see if in, in bouncing that rig back to the dock, if it could have burped off enough of the diluent that would have been lost. So we do some kind of reenaction sometimes, possibly if, if it provides some information to us. No retrospective or retroactive 
But as I said, there's no going back in, in time to go back in, in, to the scene. So what we get is, is all we get, and so we have to do the best with, with that. Uh, on occasion, we will do a man dive on a piece of equipment after it's been declared that it's man safe to go back in the water, and uh, that's strictly on military military equipment. I've got a few graphs to put up, and let me just state ahead of time that that these graphs and those that follow, we have to be very careful of making any kind of determination from these because we don't know the underlying populations of, of the number of dives being done on any kind of specific either open circuit, closed circuit. We don't know the, the population of the divers actually doing it. We don't know the dive complexity, the, uh, the inherent risk of the dives they may have been making. So when I post these numbers, please just keep in mind that we, we really don't know. Uh, we can't necessarily say, oh, well, open circuit is safer than closed circuit or vice versa. But we do know that of the investigation we did, 157 in the last 34 years, 112 were fatal, 45 were non-fatal. And here is that same information broken down into open circuit, closed circuit, and surface supplied. Once again, please keep in mind that we don't know the underlying populations here of, of that equipment. On the side, when I'm not at the experimental diving unit, I teach college math and physics. And when I throw this graph, this Venn diagram up, not this specific one, but one like it, I get a lot of students. I can hear the gnashing of teeth and, and their fear. But this is a very telling Venn diagram here, and that's, that's why I put it up. And to help you understand this just a little bit, the, the, the center of this, this Venn diagram, the part in green there is the human. And as Leon mentioned earlier, that uh, the human is, is definitely the, uh, the key to a lot of these, these accidents that we have. And of course, that makes sense because the, the human's involved. But to help you to view this just a little bit, let me try my pointer out here. I think I can use the, the mouse. Right here we have seven instances that were human and maintenance, but inconclu or they were conclusive, so we could decide what the results were. And then you have 30 that were human and equipment, but uh, we were able to decide that what the actual outcome of that was. And then we have, if you see the, look a little bit further down, you see the 22, and that's the exclusively human incidence causes. So the maintenance was fine, the equipment was fine, and yet we were able to determine what the outcome was and why it happened. And then, of course, there's the, the human and in, uh, inconclusive results, of which there's 74, and that's the, uh, the abundance there. And that's where the, the maintenance uh, and the equipment were fine. So we're doing a good job, uh, you might say, uh, with uh, the, the design of the equipment, the maintenance of the equipment. But it's, uh, it's when the human starts to interact with it that uh, we wind up with some, some bad results there. So just kind of summarizing that view graph, we have the equipment issues and maintenance issues are, are rare. Contaminated gas is, is a rare event as well. Environmental issues are rare, and it really comes down to the, the human error and the fallibility. I'll put a quote there just to uh, get us thinking. We're all human. We recognize that. And when we start putting this equipment on is where we start to get some challenges. And that's, that's all I have. We had lots and lots of discussions on this topic uh, yesterday. Any today? Uh, Paul Haynes in the UK. And I'd like, to, uh, if possible, to drag Gavin into this question because we have uh, accident investigators from three different nations here. We've seen the Dan data where cause of death, in most cases, 95% roughly, is drowning. We've seen now uh, Oscar's presentation, which kind of backs that up. And so my question is, having now investigated many rebreather fatalities, do you feel that the use of mouthpiece retaining strap might have saved a number of individ individuals on certain occasions? It's a, it's a safety drum I've been beating for about 15 years. Um, so my question is, yes, understand that the triggers, the disabling agents are obviously key to determining what went on, but ultimately drowning is causing death. What's the last line of mitigation for that? Possibly a mouthpiece retaining strap. Do you believe that's of use? Well, if we look at the, um, the Swedish Navy diving, it's to most part full face mask diving. 
And I think that if you're going to do that, you need to add a bailout valve as well. I haven't had enough experience with the gag strap to really have an opinion on that, but I think we have a fairly good safety records with uh, full face mask use at least. As specifically named to cut in with that. I think as we've seen uh, over the last couple of days, the, the post-mortem cause of death is drowning in most of these instances. To actually drown, your mouth has to be open and water has to go in, fundamentally. And so, if you have an incident whereby you've fallen unconscious, the mouthpiece has come out, whether it's hypoxia, hyperoxia, hypercapnia, whatever reason, and then the mouth's open and water's gone in, you will drown. Um, that is a very preventable final outcome, such that if you can keep the airway patent and you can protect the airway, then people will not drown. They may die of hypoxia or, or some other instance. So, you know, going back to, I've just given a, a presentation on the pre-market testing and the European standard. The European standard actually includes in it the fact that the rebreather shall have a system to retain the mouthpiece in the mouth or the face mask on the face to pretend, prevent you from drowning. So I think, you know, partly a personal perspective, but yes, you should have a way of protecting the airway in the event of an incident, and that will save drowning. So yes, I believe you should have a, at least a mouthpiece retraining strap, and preferably a full face mask. So just to, uh, just to finish off there, perhaps, you know, we have an opt opportunity here now to perhaps start to reconsider this, and perhaps start to embed this within our standard as training organizations, perhaps as manufacturers, because we've got the hard data now. Cause of death is drowning. How can we help prevent that final outcome? And there's something very simple, I believe. A mouthpiece retraining strap would, would help towards that considerably. There's no guarantees, but it's going to protect the airway for a limited amount of time, perhaps enough time to, for, for your buddy to turn around and go, oh, you're unconscious, I'm going to recover you. Um, we've just seen Oscar talk about a instant where it was not diving related as such, it was an allergy. He went unconscious, lost his mouthpiece. He would have survived that instance on land. He died because he didn't have a mouthpiece retaining strap, possibly, and drowned. So I think it's, I think it's uh, something we, as a community, need to seriously start to look at and perhaps change a culture. 30 years ago, we wouldn't have, uh, there's resistance to seatbelts. And the motor in public didn't want it, the manufacturers didn't want it. But the day seatbelts were enforced, driving fatalities dropped significantly. I think we should think about a change of culture on that point. Thank you. Dick Van, uh, Dan America. A comment for Paul. Unfortunately, uh, drowning is relatively uninformative. Uh, uh, you could drown as a result of hypoxia. Uh, you could drown if you run out of gas. And uh, we really have to look further down the, the chain of events that leads to the final cause of death, which uh, frequently is just written down as drowning because the coroner found you were in the water, you were dead, pulled out. So it, it, the, this whole investigation needs to be taken back to closer to as well as can be done to the cause of the, the event. And uh, that really goes back and starts with training uh, first responders and, uh, and really training instructors and training dive operators to know what to do and how to secure the scene in the event of an accident. I don't think that's been addressed uh, as much as I would have liked to, and it's, uh, it's an important factor that uh, needs to be touched on. Uh, I, I, just to, to comment on that, I, I, I completely agree that one really has to, to look down the chain of, of, of events, and, and that's why I really that's why I mentioned that it's unfortunate when the police do, doesn't want to do a, a investigation once the, uh, if, if it's cause of death was drowning. But on the other hand, I think that Paul has, a, has, has something also that if, if we can protect the airway, uh, then, we, then we've, we've kind of taken away some part from that and at least increased the amount of time that, that, that uh, recovery is possible. Your guess. Just to sum up the last days, really, I think your data also shows that in case of a fatality, the equipment is probably, well, it's least likely to be um, 
to have caused that. Um, you mentioned human human error and all this. But we have heard from the manufacturers how anxious they are to improve it. But it seems like the technology side is actually fairly safe in comparison. It's the human side that is most likely to cause it. So question to you, in your opinion, would you believe that we should um, reconsider the, the training side? And why do we not have the training, uh, training agencies up on podium to represent their view? I can only speak for the, the, the military, and of course, the very thorough application they have in, in of training and uh, a consistent uh, methodology of, of, of retraining or recertification. And I think that might be something that m is missing in the civilian sector, is, is coming back every couple of years and proving that you can still do this. And I know most of us in here say, oh, you know, you've lost your mind. I don't want to go back and do that again. Well, look at the aviation community. Uh, I know Dr. Clark flies a lot, and I've got other friends that fly. And periodically, you have to prove you can still do it. And so that, that might be something that we, we look into. Well, also specifically training standards. Do you believe they're up to the task? Uh, sure, yes. Thank you. Gentlemen? Jorge Mawad, I'm the, in, in the Galapagos Islands. And we have, we do liverboards, land-based. And a liverboard can be 120 miles away from the mainland, from the central islands that are 600 miles away from the mainland in South America. And we're operating rebreathers. My question here is, we haven't had an accident yet, but in case of an accident, what is the procedure you would recommend for such a remote destination when there are no medical facilities, where there are no test facilities available, and when the equipment, if we know it's not always a big thing, but in a liability perspective, that's the first thing that's going to be questioned. I would suggest secure the equipment as best you could and get law enforcement involved as fast as possible without it making any modifications to the equipment. And for trans that equipment will probably need to be transported in an airplane. So that means probably sh uh, shutting off cylinders, take them, taking them off. So you're, when, when you do that, we're basically altering the unit. Is, is there a procedure that you can, you uh, can follow something that a dummy could do? Well, uh, and exactly, and possibly a dummy would do it, so I would suggest that, that you would try and get a, a chain of custody established and get uh, either local law enforcement or pretty much most countries now have some form of Coast Guard, get someone on the maritime law enforcement on the seas to get involved in that and let them make contact with, with who possibly may be taking over the, the equipment and do any kind of investigation and let them dictate how the equipment should be, uh, should be stowed and, and shipped. Thanks. Gavin Anthony again. Uh, just to, to cut in on that, uh, this is something that the UK military has actually had to face because we deploy people all over the world, but our centre for investigating the incident is back in the UK. And the vital thing with that is if you are in remote locations, you think this may occur, you need to put your procedures in place before, you, before it happens so you know what to do. And I think that's almost in threefold. Firstly, you've got to have a very clear checklist that everyone on the dive site knows about, what to do and what not to do, particularly with rebreathers. The second one is there are some things that you can do locally, and that can be there. But the big one for remote locations, and I've had discussions with other people over this, is you have to make transport arrangements and arrangements with an appropriate test capability in advance and particularly the difficulty is flying. People will not want to fly a rebreather with pure oxygen cylinders and caustic material in it. So you have to get that in place. Now, certainly the UK military has put that in place, so we can repatriate e equipment from anywhere in the world. But I would suggest, you know, it may be a, a more global thing for something like Paddy to make those sort of arrangements uh, so you can resolve it. Thank you, or next. Uh, just one point on sort of practical aspects of using a mouthpiece restraining strap. After some prompting from Paul, about six weeks ago I put one on, on mine and I've been diving it um, for every dive since. I absolutely hated it uh, for the first couple of dives and now I probably wouldn't dive uh, without it. And I think there, there might be some resistance to it, but um, it's, worth, it's worth pushing with. Leon Scamorn, uh, Interspace Systems, the, uh, you know, the point of 
a head strap, full face mask, is to prevent a wet drowning and flooding of the breathing loop. The uh, head strap isn't good enough. Basically, the, it keeps the dive surface valve in your mouth, and when I was a young serviceman diving a LAR-5, we used the head strap just to help prevent jaw fatigue. If you pass out and you flip over on your back, and it's going to prevent the breathing hoses from coming out of your mouth, but water, when you relax the jaw, water will still go in. A full face mask is the only thing that doesn't guarantee it, but it decreases the odds of flooding the loop and drowning the diver. Keeping the loop dry is also beneficial for a rescuer because he doesn't try to have to keep the uh, breathing hoses in the diver's mouth. So now the rescuer can focus on pushing the, uh, op or opening the bailout valve or doing a dill uh, loop flush and trying to change whatever loop gas that's in the breathing loop to try to recover the diver. And he doesn't, he has both arms available to do that instead of having one arm trying to keep the DSV in the mouth. So I believe if an incident did happen, a good buddy and a way of keeping the loop dry, and that's including the diver, is, is a good answer. Okay. And I think we still need to solve that. Richard Harris, Adelaide, just on Leon's point, I would agree with what he's saying about the, the role of the mouth, uh, sorry, the mouthpiece gag to improve jaw fatigue, but not not necessarily decrease the risk of, of water entering the airway. I read in the rebreather two proceedings that there that there was some recommendations about using full face mask uh, after the last meeting, and as a uh, someone who does cave diving in in very cold water, we've used three or four of the, of the commonly available full face masks uh, to try and A, for a thermal protection and B, uh, to prevent us from uh, uh, prolonged high partial pressures of oxygen in case of a seizure. And to my mind, having gone through this process, we've now discarded the full face masks because of the other hazards that have been introduced by the use of them in technical diving. And my feeling is that um, and I haven't been formally trained with full face masks, so perhaps you know we could have done it better. But um, for the average diver, a full face mask is not a simple piece of uh, apparatus to use, and, and it brings introduces a lot of other complexities and hazards, which may actually be worse than the problem we're trying to solve. So, if we're going to go down this path as a recommendation, it's something that needs to be very carefully considered. Mark Kenny from Paddy. Vince, I presume from your last Venn diagram that the majority of the incidents you're investigating there were military divers? Uh, um, sir, say again? Your Venn diagram, your last slide, where you were, yes, exactly that one. Presumably the majority of these incidents were military divers. Not necessarily. If we go back uh, to that view graph, I, I didn't break those down specifically uh, because I wouldn't want anyone to get the implication that there's more military uh, incidents than civilian. Obviously, uh, if I did that, what you'd see here is, is uh, quite a few military because we get all of the military uh, investigations. Go back to the Venn diagram again. Well, the, the point I would make, presumably there are a, a reasonable proportion of these divers as military divers. The, the key thing to me is that there is this large segment where the human is the problem. And speaker after speaker has described the human-machine interface and the, the human being as being the weak point in the system. Certainly when Paddy has designed programs for rebreather training, we've gone to a lot of effort to try and train the diver as well as possible. We've reinforced things like checklists very strongly. But it still seems to be that although we can expect a human to perform adequately most of the time, inevitably because of the nature of people, they're going to have the occasional bad day. I see the purpose of an event like this not only to take stock of where we are in the state of the art now, but also to try and lay foundations as to where we would like to see the technology go in the future. Uh, would you agree it would be beneficial if as far as possible the machine takes away as many potential errors from the diver as possible as a desirable feature into the future? I'm, I'm going to speak not from as, as an accident investigator, but just from as a rebreather diver. And for me, I like to have the, as much control of that, that rig as possible. Uh, that's just me. 
and I like I like having the knowledge that I can control if I need to flush, if I need to uh, get more dill in there, more O2, uh, come off the rig. I, I like having control of that, and, and, uh, and less of that uh, I want to be electronics that's telling me what to do. Uh, I'd rather use my head as the, as the computer. Uh, obviously, one of the drawbacks to that is if I get into a situation where my head's not functioning as, as well as it should, then maybe electronics would be a, would be a nice thing to, to make some of those decisions for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, it's also the aspect of simplicity. So it, it, it's, it's hard to say on a generic factor. Of course, reducing the, the risk of, of, of failures is, uh, or, or problems is, 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 uh, is a good thing, but, but there might be many ways to get there. Martin, uh, Martin Parker, Ambient Pressure Diving. We're trying to come out of this forum with recommendations, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that many, many of the incidents result in drowning in the end. The, uh, the end game is drowning, and it results in, in that because the diver was alone. And I really do think one of the outcomes of this uh, meeting should be we should be encouraging buddy diving, uh, three breathers. And uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of a very, very high percentage of the incidents are caused through diver separate, or not caused because of dive, dive separation. Diver separation, diving alone is a key f feature in many, many, many incidents. And I would hazard a guess at 90%, but I haven't really analyzed the data. I have the data, but I just think we should bear that in mind. So we're talking about trying to stop drowning by fitting gag straps and everything else. We could actually improve things a lot by recommending people dive with a buddy. I definitely agree. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. It's time for the next speaker.